Okay. Every year people ask me what they should get their swimmer for Christmas. And I always tell them the same thing. Get a pair of drag socks made by Aquavolo. It's the perfect stocking stuffer for any swimmer. Honestly, there's no simpler training tool to build power in the water than a pair of drag socks. Go to aquavolo.com and use the code Brett, B-R-E-T-T, at checkout and save 10%. The offer's good only through November, so order now. Okay, Tom Luxinger, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. I'm humbled and honored. Well, no, I, I appreciate your time. Where are you coming from? Um, from New- I'm living in New York City right now from my own little 500 square foot Manhattan, Manhattan Palace. <laughs> Manhattan Palace. What do you do for work day to day? I work at Columbia University uh, doing fundraising for their uh, college. And uh, I, my demographic is... Um, current students as well as uh, first year alumni so I get to get to work with 22 and 23 year olds all day which is a good way to spend your day nice awesome man well listen you've got a, a, a an interesting story that's why we wanted to have you on the podcast um you're one of the best swimmers in the history of the U.S. um and then you've also got a unique uh personal story as well which I, I wanted to share with everybody as well but like let's let's go back to kind of where swimming started for you? How did this all begin? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my So my swimming journey actually began even kind of before I was born. Uh, my parents met at a lifeguard tournament on Eastern Long Island. <laughs> uh, that is something that is a big thing out here. I know in Australia, they also have a pretty big uh, lifeguard competition. So um, they met on the beach and, and, you know, fell in love, got married and decided to have three kids. And my parents were very athletic. My mom was a YMCA national champion swimmer and my dad was an all American football and lacrosse player. So naturally they wanted their kids to be athletes. I think that that is a normal thing, right? You have kids and uh, you want them to kind of follow in your footsteps. And so they put my brothers and I in every which way, shape and form sport that you could possibly imagine. And we hated every single one of them. Um, as as a father, I'm sure you know that like there's there's things that you want to throw your kids into, and they're like, oh heck no, this is not happening. Mm. Um, so it was a constant fight. It was a fight to go to Saturday football. It was a fight to go to Sunday soccer, t-ball, all of it. We couldn't stand any of it. And finally, after years of pushing us kind of into different athletic pursuits, uh, my parents kind of threw their hands up and said, they're going to do whatever they want to do. Uh, it could be art, it could be music, it could be theater, but we had to do something. Yeah. Doing, doing nothing in my family wasn't really an option. And so I came home one day and I said, mom, I think I want to join the swim team. I had a friend in fifth grade who was on the swim team and she made it sound pretty cool. So being the YMCA national champion swimmer that she was knowing that it meant 5 a.m. workouts and, and weekends along or way at meets and thousands upon thousands of miles on a car. She immediately began to cry. Uh, I believe her direct words were, Oh no, not swimming. <laughs> um, but I, they, she kind of jumped in with me and, and my parents were, you know, flipping omelets at the, at the swim at the, at those long meets and, and, uh, my mom was always timing and helping helping out at the at the meets, so it really became a, a pretty big family affair. And uh, and I found that I was good at it. Uh, and for the first time, I had a really amazing kind of close group of friends who were doing all the same things that I was doing. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be relatively successful at it, making getting a scholarship to attend the University of North Carolina. Uh, where I was a 10-time 10 10 time All-American, both first and, uh, and, uh, and consider uh, first team and, uh, you know, considerable honor, honorable mention All-American. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to, um, I was on the U.S. national team for a while, and I competed for uh, the U.S. for a couple of years outside of school, and I was fortunate enough to win a national championship in my 200-meter butterfly. So, um, 
really fun ride. Uh, I ended up retiring from athletics, from professional athletics in 2015. Um, and now I'm just kind of just starting my, was able to start m- my own professional life, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, talk us through just in terms of picking a college, um, what, what that process is like and what was it like for you and why did you end up at uh, UNC? Uh, well, I, it's actually funny because I was, I was checking out Auburn. You were one of the, you were, I was, you were recruiting me. Mm-hmm. Um, my big thing is that I was, I, I'm a, I'm a pretty big homebody. Uh, I'm not really, uh, meant to be too far away from home. Uh, I grew up on Eastern Long Island, so it's, it kind of makes sense that I, I ended up in the city that I did. Um, but I wanted a, I wanted a team where I was, I was going to be able to make a difference um, and where I was going to get a really good education and where a scholarship was going to be a pretty big thing. Um, you know, my parents, uh, we didn't, they, my parents didn't pay for my college education. I actually took out student loans. So uh, they sat me down and they said, you know, swim fast and study hard because we can't, we're not going to pay for it and we can't mm-hmm. pay, afford to pay for it. So um, that was a big factor in kind of my decision. I wanted to be at a, at a well-rounded school where I was going to get a really good education. I wanted to be able to compete on, on, on the level. And I also wanted to improve. And I, I found that I was able to get all three of those things at uh, North Carolina. And that is no shot to your ability to recruit. I always had a very good time at Auburn. <laughs> <laughs> well, we certainly wanted you, but it was, it's, it's always fun to, to get to know an athlete and then watch them swim. And, you know, I, I cheer for, for people, even when they're wearing other people's caps, but um, especially if I know them, but, but part of your story, uh, if, if they don't, people don't know you, most people do, but if they don't know you, part of your story is that um, you're a gay man. You came out in uh, 2014 why do you think that's important for us to talk about now? Oh, well, thank you for asking that question. Yes, I am a very out and proud uh, gay man. Um, and it's an important thing to talk about because I have found the more, the more that I talk about it and the more that other people talk about it, the less kind of taboo this issue becomes. Um, I live in an area where I, it's a you know major con- I, I call it my concrete conglomerate because it's just this huge um, accepting you can kind of walk out of your door and be a different person any which way but I realize that that's not the case for everybody out there um, and the more people who are vocal and more people who are comfortable about saying those very simple three words you know I'm gay um, well two if you make the add the apostrophe in there. Um, <laughs> it becomes less kind of, it becomes less of a shock. It, it's not something that people look at. It's just, it becomes a part of who you are as opposed to being this additional characteristic. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking this uh, time to talk about this because I've had actually people reach out to me and say, you know, you, sh- you should talk to this person about their personal lives or that person. I think it's I think it's relevant. I think it's important. I think, um, you know, you're a leader in your, your community, um, which is the gay community and, and, uh, and you're, a, uh, an incredible man with, with an incredible story, um, in terms of, you know, everything you did, it, even the fact that you just said that you had to take out student loans to go to college. I wish my kids could hear that, you know? So it's like They're uh, paying them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? every part of your story is important for people to hear, but especially the part about being a gay man and coming out. And, um, and I kind of just want to talk through that a little bit because, you know, even as recent as a few years ago, it was certainly taboo to, to come out and talk about it. And there, there may have been some shame and humiliation for certain people. Um, but now it's, it's, it's changing. It's, it's still not where it needs to be but certainly changing. But what was it like for you? When, when did you feel like something was a little bit different for you? And then how did you process all of that? Well, I was always different. Um, there wasn't, uh, I didn't fit in with the kind of normal quote. I use that in air quotes now because what is normal, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I grew up in the, I was born in 91. I grew up in the, I grew up in the, you know, 90s and early 2000s and where everyone was kind of, that's the phase where everyone's kind of trying to fit in, right? Um, And in an area where things like social media didn't exist. So 
you know, one of the amazing things about this kind of well-connected world that we live in is that you can always find someone to relate to. Um, there are fallbacks to that, of course. Everybody has immediate access to everybody else and, and all of the horrible things that can kind of come along with being behind a screen. Mm -hmm. But there are some really amazing things that social media can do. And you, you have this ability to kind of uh, find someone who you relate to. Uh, being born in 91 and growing up in the early 2000s, kind of going through puberty and adolescence and all of that kind of stuff without that, um, it definitely came, it, it, you, you do want to fit in. You don't want to have, you don't want to be kind of the odd man out. And so I always knew that I was different. I didn't relate to like the, the other boys in my class. Um, I'm one of three, three boys in my immediate family. And, you know, they always kind of had their, their, their little relationship and their little click and all that kind of stuff. And I just didn't kind of quite get, and I didn't quite fit into. So I always knew I was, I, I always knew I had something that was different about me. But I didn't really kind of fully figure it out until I was about ninth or 10th grade. And that's when people start dating. You kind of start to experience girls and boys for the first time. And I, I, was, I was dating someone who was absolutely stunning, brilliant, kind of everything that you are looking for in a, in a significant other. And she was kind of developing these, these feelings and, and I just couldn't get there I, I was it was kind of like we were just on different levels when it came to what we were comfortable expressing and what we were comfortable saying to each other and I just I couldn't do it and so I realized that I was that that was probably the factor that I wasn't a I wasn't a straight man and so I really just kind of threw myself into my athletics um, I didn't date uh, throughout college I didn't have a girlfriend throughout college I didn't you know, date boys throughout college. I was very much a very closeted athlete. Um, and so I worked my way through all of that. And all of a sudden kind of this social media revolution happens, right? Where everyone is, everyone is pretty well interconnected with each other and everybody has access to everybody. And as a closeted man, there's nothing more frightening than, uh, a, than social media in reality, because you start to worry about how you sound what you said, what you look like. Did I, was I too effeminate on that call? Did I, you know, did I flick my wrist uh, on, on this podcast? You know, there, so there are all these things that you're kind of constantly thinking about. Um, and I remember I was kind of, I was on the national team when I was a junior in college and, um, but I was always kind of, there were always people faster than me. I wasn't the it person, right? Like Tyler Clary was, was, a, was one of the tuner flyers at that time. Dan Madwood was also there. Bobby Boyer was also there. So there were the, all these people who were kind of ahead of me and I wasn't the top dog. Uh, 2013 changed that uh, when I won my national title. And I was, if you look back on that race, it really was one of shock and awe. I didn't expect to win. I didn't really think I was going to win. Nobody expected me to win. And usually when that happens, your reaction is something that's super proud. You're very mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, fists in the air, you know, screaming about how excited. And I was, I was scared. Um, and it had to do with the fact that I was well aware of the, um, the next step in this is that someone is going to be very interested to find out something a little bit more about this small town kid from Long Island. Mm. Um, and I, that was my immediate thought was mm. how the hell am I going to hide this now? Wow. Um, Stacy Michael Miller, who is the USADA rep for USA swimming. She came up to me afterwards because I won my national title. I was going to world championships and <laughs> she, you have to sign your drug testing waiver and I couldn't sign it because my adrenaline was so high and I was so anxious. Like my, my signature didn't look like my normal signature. Mm -hmm. And that's how stressed I was about that simple thing. Now in hindsight, it was the most remarkable thing that has ever happened to me. I'm yeah. by, no mean, by no means diminishing that accomplishment, but it was scary. Um, and so I went a year as a uh, as the defending national champion. And I remember I was up in Colorado Springs doing some, uh, doing a very hard workout with uh, Bob Bowman and, and, and Michael. And I couldn't hit my tape pace times. I couldn't hit my, um, 
I couldn't hit any of my like goal times. I was just, I was so overwhelmed by the fact that I was still trying to hide this. And I, I said to myself that practice, if I don't repeat my national championship, I need to, I need to deal with this. Um, and so I did, I didn't repeat my, I didn't repeat my title that, that summer. And so I decided that I would slowly kind of start coming out to my friends and my family. Wow. Wow. Incredible. Part of the story just to there. So uh, be, before you decide to come out and before you do come out, was there any points in your life where you were, were bullied or did, did people um, question you in any way or, or did you just fit in as normally as you could up to that point? Um, I mean, as an adolescent, I think bullying is something that happens no matter who you are, right? Um, it's such a sad thing now. Um, but I, I think that I definitely was teased a lot uh, growing up. But once I found my sport, people kind of left me alone. Um, I, I wasn't too much of an outspoken person in school. Um, a lot of people didn't know that I was a, even that good of a swimmer until uh, I was 16 years old and I, they announced that I was going to Olympic trials. So um, I, it wasn't like it was, you know, something that was kind of always harping over my head, but I had a different, I just had a different group of people. I fit differently with um, the people that I went to school with. And then I, I would go to some practice and those were my people. So yeah. um, those people kind of made it tolerable. Uh, and to this day, I still keep in touch with a number of people from high school. One of my closest friends, I was in her wedding, you know, and I, I met her in third grade. So by no means was I someone who was, you know, constantly, constantly bullied and constantly yeah. picked on. But sure. I think that every kid goes through that nowadays. So I, I think you decided to come out in 2014. Is that correct? Uh, yes. 2014 was the, it was the year after it was due. It was September 28th, 2014, another date. Oh, wow. Okay. So what, what, why that day? Uh, so I was actually uh, doing a clinic in a very rural area. Um, and I was in the Midwest in a town that like you drove, you know, four hours outside of a city. And I was with Carolyn Joyce and I was with Michael Weiss. I'll never forget this. And it was the same, around the same time of year that this, someone tried to burn down the Chicago O'Hare Hair Flight Tower. Mm. And as a result, all of the flights back to Baltimore were delayed or canceled. And so I was kind of dealing with this and coming to terms with this very privately before going to this, before going to this clinic and, and teaching. And I remember, um, I remember I was going through, I, was, I remember I was giving my talk and giving my, you know, my spiel about mm. who I was and what I had accomplished. And because of the very, uh, you know, rural nature of the environment, mm -hmm. it, I, I just came to this real or thought that these people would not want my advice if they knew who I really was. Right. And so, you know, during that clinic, I was just, I was sweating. I, was mumbling I was stumbling all of the things that kind of ro usually roll off my tongue and all of the jokes that I would normally make I couldn't I couldn't connect with the kids I just felt very kind of disjointed and very disconnected mm. and so we were supposed to I was supposed to fly through Chicago and so instead of flying to Chicago to make my way back to Baltimore I actually we actually drove and it was just, I, it was like something like a six or a seven hour drive mm. And I remember thinking to myself, I just need to get to Chicago. Like, I just need to get to the, to this hotel that we're staying at because I have to call my parents. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't hide this anymore. Oh, wow. And so I got to the, I got to the hotel and it was the longest six hour car ride I think I've ever had in my entire life. And I called my mom and my dad and they were like, it was midnight, something like that, <laughs> maybe 1130 midnight. And as a parent, you know, mm. 1130 midnight phone call doesn't usually, something's wrong, right? Mm. And so I called them and I said, you know, just, I, I said, I, I need to talk to you both right now. And they were like, what the hell did you do? Oh, wow. And I was like, everything is fine. I'm fine, but I need to tell you something. And I said, 
well, I'm gay. And my mom said, oh, thank God, I thought you were going to tell us you were going to have, you had cancer and were dying. Oh, wow. Jeez. And then my dad literally said, so what? Wow. So, and then immediately following that, knowing the kind of horrible uh, dichotomy of what it is to come out as a member of the LGBTQ community, my mom actually asked what floor I was on at a hotel because she was afraid I was going to hurt myself. Oh. So it, it like, and she almost flew to Chicago. She was like, do you need me to come tonight? Cause I will. Mm. And I said, no, I'm fine. Like I'm getting on a flight in the morning. I I'm okay. Like, thank you guys for being so supportive. And they just kind of, and then I got back from Chicago and my mom was actually waiting in my apartment when I got home that afternoon. Wow. So easily though, I mean, I, I get kind of emotional talking about it mm. because not, I'm, I'm well aware that not many people have that reaction. Um, and not many people have families who would do things like offer to fly to Chicago at midnight and uh, drive five hours from Long Island to Baltimore to be with their kid as soon as they possibly could. So um, I'm well aware that I'm very fortunate and I'm very blessed in that regard. Is that something uh, incredible, by the way? <laughs> incredible. I mean, you almost made me cry, but... Um... Is that something you expected from them or what did you expect them? How did you expect them to react? I don't know how I expected them to react, actually. Uh, I've never been asked that question. Um, but, but it's it really, I think I was just af afraid that they would look at me differently. Um, I, when you, I have a, one of my brothers has special needs. And so when you grow up with a, a, a member of the family who, who has kind of a disability, you always want to be that kind of, you, you have this thought in your mind that you're going to be the, the kind of normal one. And mm -hmm. this just made me abnormal. Sure. And so um, that's, I think what I was the most afraid of was that I wasn't going to be normal for them, which is weird to say out loud. But um, my dad even told me later, he was like, uh, so great. You won't have a white picket fence with a, with a wife named Jody. You'll just have a husband <laughs> named Joe. Like who cares? <laughs> so in hindsight, all of it was kind of built up in my, in my own perceptions of who I thought they wanted me to be. But it, uh, it, with one phone call, it really, uh, wiped all of my fear away, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, beautiful response by your parents, by the way. Yeah, they're amazing. Um, you know, as, as a member of the community now and, and somebody who says, yeah, I feel pretty blessed to have parents who've reacted like that. How, how do you mentor somebody um, through a process like that, knowing that not everybody's parents are going to react like that? It must, must be difficult, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I do my very best to um, be a resource for members within my community, but I'm also well aware of the fact that there are some things that I'm just not trained to handle. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some amazing resources out there like the Trevor Project who can kind of walk people off a, talk people kind of off of a really, talk people through a very difficult situation. I'm not mm -hmm. a psychologist, um, sure. you know, I, there, are, there are things that I'm not inept to handle. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm well aware of that. So I usually, when, when people kind of reach out and say, you know, my parents aren't accepting me, they're telling me I have to move out of the house, which fortunately doesn't happen too often. I usually have to direct them towards another resource because I just don't have, I don't have the ability. I'm not trained in that regard. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a very careful line to toe. Uh, that's interesting that you, you bring that up. Um, do you know of any, services that you could recommend for someone that's maybe watching this podcast now and connecting with your story, but knowing that that's not going to be the response that they get. What's the, what's the best advice you can give in terms of where they could go to get help? Yeah, there's, I mean, there are tons of resources out there. Um, it, I mean, the Trevor project comes to the top of my head because that is one of the most remarkable um, nonprofits that, that are, that are out there for LGBT youth. Mm -hmm. Um the there's another one uh athlete ally is also a really amazing one mm -hmm. um 
I was fortunate enough to kind of serve on their on their on their board and not on their board, but with work with Hudson, yeah. uh, Tyler, the founder, very closely. Um, so if someone is is really in a situation where they feel like they might not get the response that I got, um, yep. just do a little bit of research on these types of programs. They're pretty amazing. Sure, I appreciate that. Now, yeah. the the first challenge is tell the parents, and then you've got to go down the line. Was there any any obstacles down the line? Were there any challenges? Anyone? Any roadblocks? Gosh, yeah. Um, but a lot of it was my own kind of mental hurdle. Uh, what people don't realize is that like a lot of people don't care. Um, there are, and and to be honest, the people who do care might you might not be the people that you kind of want to surround yourself with. Yeah. Um, that's hard when it becomes your family, but when it comes to your friends and people that you connect with on that aren't your blood relatives, they're, it's, they're not that important. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so I did, I went through kind of the line of telling my friends or telling my family first. And then I told my, my immediate circle of friends who I was training with. And then from there, I just kind of very, I would casually mention it in a sentence. And every time I said it, it became easier and easier to say, um, and now it's something that I don't even think about, you yeah. know? Um, and it's also not something that people feel the need to address anymore, yeah. which is pretty amazing. So, um, but one thing that I do wish and I do regret is that I did this very fast. Um, I came out in December or in September of, of 20, uh, 20, I, I came out in September 28th, 2014. Mm -hmm. And then by the time the world knew it was December of 2014. So it was only mm -hmm. about three months where I really kind of got to actually live in my own skin before I told the world. Um, do I regret it? No, I think that's just kind of a lesson that I have learned, but um, it was very fast. There were a lot of people who knew a lot about a lot about a very intimate aspect of my life. Um, when I wasn't necessarily fully ready for it. Yeah. Well, I, pr I appreciate you talking about it now. Do you, do you think we should stop talking about this issue? Is it, is it's, I mean, is this important right now what we're doing? Yes, absolutely. Um, it is a, do I wish we, we lived in a time where this wasn't something, a conversation that we would be having and, you know, I, I could go kind of wherever and bring my significant other. Uh, absolutely. But we're just not there yet. Um, I think that the more we talk about it, the more discussion that we have, the more that people with a, a platform like yourself are, are comfortable having these discussions, the better off members of the LGBT population are. Um, it's quite amazing because you, I have seen the shift. Like we, there, there have been kind of massive um, changes in, in television programming and, and, um, and just kind of the the characters that people are playing now mm -hmm. they're much more relatable they're not as flamboyant they're kind of just people and then you also do have people who are so it's like you kind of they're they're realizing that running the entire spec spectrum of the lgbt community is very important because someone might relate to someone who likes to wear you know nail polish and makeup whereas uh someone might just relate to someone else who just goes to work and has a husband yeah you know so it's diversity in that regard is a very important thing. And I think that it is getting better, but we still do have room for improvement, which means that we still need to have these conversations and we still need to talk about it. Well, good. Well, I'm, I'm glad we're doing it today. I'm, I'm thankful for you being so open and, and there's no doubt that someone's going to be listening to this and they're going to connect with your story for sure. And so. yeah, th there's no doubt about that. So um, this is a, a, an important issue for me. Um, we've got we've got a big election coming up don't we and there's a lot of important issues out there right now but um this is certainly um one of the issues that needs to be addressed and and uh is there anything else we can be doing what, what, what else could regular people be doing for the the community um i don't know you tell me yeah there are so being being an ally is not just uh, a, a you know a something where it's uh, being an ally is work right um, even within my own community there are things that I'm constantly learning um, you know trans issues that's something that I, I, I'm constantly 
mm. educating myself on. Um, so even in as a member of the demographic, I still have ways to go when it comes to my own education. Yep. And I'm not shy about that. I think that as we all grow and we, we learn about these things, it's important to continue to educate yourself. So just read up. Uh, don't shy away from a, a some an, an issue about you know LGBT rights uh, or LGBT problems. Um, knowledge is power. So do your research, know about the issues, uh, and and be willing to talk about them. Um, also, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Right? Um, I've done this many times. I, I'm fortunate enough to have people who use different pronouns in my, in my, in my life. And sometimes I'll misuse the pronouns and they'll correct me because they would rather me misuse the program pronouns with the knowledge that I'm doing my very best to mm. change my kind of mindset and educate myself on it, than use the incorrect one maliciously. Yeah. Uh, so don't be afraid to make mistakes when it comes to that. Um, and be coachable with them. If someone says you use the wrong program pronoun, be accepting of that. Don't say, well, you know, don't, don't get defensive about it. Be like, I'm yeah. sorry, I'll, I'll be better about it moving forward. Um, ally stickers actually go a really long way. Mm -hmm. Um, things like the rainbow flags that people kind of hang on their window. I work in higher education, so they have these like little safe zone LGBT, uh, you know, if someone's trained in, in, in the issues in the, in the community mm. that, or a member of the community, they put like little, you know, pride flags on their, on their window or have it somewhere on their person or in their signature or something like that. Um, so those are just kind of the first steps that I would take is just educate, be willing to make mistakes, be apologetic for those mistakes, um, be well, and, and willing to change those and, and put something rainbow on. Like it's a, <laughs> It's a uh, LGBT affiliated people are, 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 are oftentimes uh, drawn to that flag. So if, if I see something with a rainbow flag in it, I'm like, oh, okay, that's an ally of mine. I can be a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, got it. It makes sense. Well, listen, you're a great leader within your community and you're a great leader within the swimming community too. You, you give back and you, you do a lot for the, the future of the swimming community. And I, I appreciate it. You're a great worker for um, a great clinician for fitter and faster. And um, I love working with you. So thanks for this today. I appreciate the uh, insight. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Uh, and I'm again, humbled and honored that you were willing to have this discussion. It's, it's uh, I hope it was impactful for you and for all of the amazing listeners that you have. I appreciate it. All right, Tom. Thanks, bye. Take care. Bye-bye. See you, mate.